So, hey, uh, welcome. Uh, good afternoon, everybody who has been uh, uh, eavesdropping on my conversation with my good friend, Ida. Uh, we have had the great opportunity to work together on a couple of proposals. Uh, she is one of my go-to faculty when it comes to cybersecurity curriculum, as well as uh, the, uh, the human computer interface. And so a little bit of those topics will be touched on today. So I guess as a more formal introduction, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, one of our faculty members from the Computer and Information Technology Program in the Purdue Polytechnic Institute at Purdue University and longtime serious affiliated faculty member, Ida Nombecki. Ida, <laughs> welcome. All right, thank you, Joel. It's very nice to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Um, so I am Dr. Ida Nombecki, as Joel said. I am an assistant professor in computer information te uh, technology here at Purdue. I am the very new executive director of the Purdue Cybersecurity Education Training Network Resources, which is a um, non-credit academic unit in the Polytechnic that does cybersecurity training, so cybersecurity certifications and um, cybersecurity short courses for Mainly our, our main target is professionals who are interested in upskilling. And I'm also the director of the Cybersecure Behavior Lab, which is what I run my research out of. My research is at the intersection of cybersecurity and human factors. So I look at cybersecurity education, as Joel said, I, I spend a lot of time looking at cybersecurity curriculum and how we teach people about cybersecurity. But I also spend a lot of time thinking about cybersecure behavior. How do we get people to be safer? online? How do we get people to be um, to engage in cyber hygiene? And then the flip side of that, social engineering, right? So I actually teach a course, a graduate course, uh, training social engineering penetration testers. If any of you are looking for a really cool course to take, it brings together um, psychology and information technology and all kinds of other things, acting, we do a little bit of acting in there and management and um, ethics and all sorts of things. And you get to do a really cool project where you, you get to do some social engineering penetration testing. So um, I've had a little bit of experience in that field. So that's basically what I'm going to talk about today. How do we train our social engineering penetration testers. So how do we understand what makes somebody a good social engineering penetration testers, right? Um, so we refer to um, social engineers as human hackers, because basically instead of hacking the software or hardware in a security system, they are targeting the human elements of a security system, okay? So um, I'd just like to say, please feel free to ask questions as we go. If anything um, pops up, uh, you can put it down in the chat or you can just unmute your mic. I think, yes, I think we're a small enough group that you don't need to raise your hand. You can just unmute your mic and ask a question and I should be able to answer that as we go. All right, let's see. Sorry, I'm, I'm working with several screens here. All right, okay. So why do we care about this? So social engineering is one of those growing areas, right? Um, I think we're all familiar. Most of us are in the cybersecurity space. We know that cybercrime costs companies and institutions a lot of money. Uh, the estimate for 2020 is over a trillion dollars globally. And organizations are spending more and more money, both training their employees to combat cybercrime and putting in systems, right, to protect their employees and their assets from cybercrime. And you find that social engineering is one of those areas of massive growth, right? So if you think about um, things like phishing and ransomware, uh, vishing, smishing, right? Uh, even just simple things like tailgating, right? Walking into a building behind somebody or shoulder surfing, right? Identity theft is usually the result of forms of social engineering. It shows up in a lot of places, right? And uh, currently companies are spending about 30% of their budgets on some element of social engineering attack because uh, I believe the estimate is 87% 
of cyber attacks that result in cyber breaches use some element of social engineering. So they're rarely exclusively a social engineering attack, but there is some element of social engineering built in there, right? Um, so if you look at something like the CEO scam, right? So that, that's that email scam, or um, there've been one or two cases where it was done over the phone. So you could consider that a vishing scam, where um, the malicious attacker pretends to be the CEO of a company or the CFO and asks um, somebody else in the company, usually the accounting department, to pay an invoice or to transfer money to a new account, right? Uh, approximately $1.2 billion was lost to that scam alone in the space of one year, right? Um, over 100 banks have lost money to spear phishing, that is targeted phishing attacks that are tailored specifically for a particular individual, have resulted in over a billion dollars in losses. I believe that was in 2019. Um, and social media accounts are compromised daily, all the time, right? Using farming, using watering holes, using account hijacking of other forms. So social engineering is fairly prevalent and it is growing. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with social engineering, just to make sure that we're all on the same page, this is an attack vector that basically targets, like I said, the human being in the security system. And it targets that individual by um, targeting their habits, things like trust, right, targeting their emotions, basically using psychosocial factors, right, that desire to be liked, that desire to reciprocate um, kindness, or if you receive a gift or something, you want to reciprocate. All of those elements can be used to influence individuals to compromise their own security, to compromise their own information, to compromise their own systems, so that you don't actually have to hack the system. You can get somebody to open it up for you and give you access, and that is social engineering. Um, when it comes to penetration testing, um, Social engineering penetration testers also are largely responsible for physical security. So when we talk about social engineering penetration testing, we're also talking about testing for um, things like uh, security systems that monitor people. So things like cameras, locks, um, swipe cards, those kinds of things. So the physical security elements that keep systems safe are generally considered part of social engineering. So why is social engineering so very, very successful? And it basically boils down to three factors, right? The first one being that social engineering is highly adaptable, right? Um, even if you introduce new policies, new security systems, the social engineering attacker can find new ways. As long as there is a human being somewhere in the system, we can find a new way to get to that particular individual or group of, of people, right? And that is because people are predictable. People have fixed habits. Uh, people are lazy, right? People tend to value convenience over pretty much anything else, right? Convenience over privacy, convenience over security. That's one of the, our biggest frustrations, the, those of us who work in human factor security. You can have the best security system, but if it is inconvenient for an individual, for example, you know, you can put in um, these computerized locks with swipe access or that require code or whatever it is. But if you have a smoker on your staff who is you know, going out every hour or two hours to grab a smoke, they're going to prop the door open rather than want to swipe in and enter their code every time. And that compromises your security, right? As long as there is a human being within the system, they can be manipulated. And then the third factor that makes social engineering so very, very successful 
is that very large attack surface and the multiplicity of attack vectors, right? So we have um, over uh, 7 billion cell phone subscriptions, right? There are actually as many cell phone subscriptions as there are people on the globe, which is interesting because I believe only about 30 something percent of people actually have cell phones. So there's a huge amount of people with multiple cell phones out there. Um, you have uh, 3.9 billion internet connected users, right? So connecting to the internet on various devices, uh, be it uh, computers, laptops, um, phones, or some internet of thing connected device. And you have uh, approximately 2 billion social media users, right? So these are lots and lots of people that you have access to on cyberspace that you can target in lots of different ways, right? So basically you are only limited by your access to the individuals and your imagination when it comes to social engineering which is one of the things that makes it really cool. So social engineering penetration testing, thank goodness, is becoming a more regular part of penetration testing, right? And basically, we are undergoing these simulated attacks that are intended to identify our vulnerabilities to social engineering before those vulnerabilities can be exploited. And the anatomy of a, pen, of a social engineering penetration test looks very like the anatomy of any social engineering attack, right? That's what penetration testing is. So you always start with um, your preparation, right? You gather information. Information is the lifeblood of a social engineer. I think depends on the quality of the information that you have and your access to the individuals in question. So you gather your information and you figure out what are the most reasonable attack vectors, right? So gathering that information helps you pick your targets and identify new sources of, it, of information. Um, so you can uh, create your attack vectors, develop relationships with them, right? Because most of social engineering is based on interactions with other individuals and once you've done that you can once you've established that relationship you can exploit that relationship and keep in mind establishing a relationship is something that happens very often in seconds right and you know you get your goal and if you're doing it very well you walk away and they don't even know that they have been compromised right so um, we train our social engineering penetration testers so that they are able to do this and identify vulnerabilities um, so we can keep our systems safer. So today I'm going to talk to you about a study I did with a group of social engineering penetration testers. And what I was basically looking at is what makes these people good at their jobs and how do their jobs change them? Right? How do their jobs impact their lives? How do they approach their jobs on a daily basis? Right? So this was a two-phase study. Um, it was a combination of a survey, which had a slightly larger group of participants, 20 participants. We looked at the various personality traits that influenced these people to go into this field and make them successful in this field. And we looked at the skills, knowledge, and abilities that they expressed and displayed. Right. And then we did interviews with a subset of these participants and used thematic analysis to tease out some common themes, common patterns to start to identify um, elements that made them good at their jobs, that made them good social engineers. So to share some demographic information about this group, it was 70% male. The majority of them were actually fairly young. These were mostly people who were freshly or recently out of college. And then it sort of, as the group gets older, it scales down. Um, there was one individual, no, two individuals who were um, actually over 46 and they were the team, the two team leaders. Uh, the rest of the group was, like I said, in that 26 to 35 or 36 to 45 space. 
the majority of them had a background in information technology. Um, some of them had backgrounds in other forms of engineering. So we had a, uh, a few uh, electrical engineers, uh, a couple industrial engineers, interestingly enough, an environmental engineer, and then a few folks out of computer science, which I thought was interesting. Um, we had somebody coming in with an associate's degrees, but the majority of them had bachelor's degrees, right? A couple of them had master's degrees, but those master's degrees were not actually in, so they had a bachelor's in either computer science or information technology, and then a master's in um, some form of business administration or management or something in that area. And then one individual with actually a PhD. All right, so this was a sort of mixed team of penetration testers and not all of them engaged in social engineering. All right, uh, James is asking, was there a sampling bias resulting in the large IT proportion? There was a sampling bias because this study was done with one specific company, right? Um, so this is the breakdown for the penetration testers that work for one specific company, but the, it was um, the majority of the work that this company does is uh, cybersecurity readiness. So they do a lot of penetration testing. Right. Um, so yes, yeah, so like I said, um, this was actually a team of penetration testers and not all of them engaged in social engineering, right? Some of them only pitched in occasionally. So, you know, like once or twice a year. So about 10% of them did less spent less than 10% of their time on social engineering. Um, there was a group that spent about 68% of their time, um, sorry, there was about 68% of the group spent about 30% of their time in social engineering. Um, those who did the majority, like almost exclusively, only social engineering, uh, there was actually only one individual who did that, so 5% of this group. Right. But this allowed us to compare a little bit amongst people who did a lot of social engineering and people who did very little of it, because in this particular work setting, those who did um, social engineering were allowed to choose to do that. So they weren't uh, sort of assigned to be part of the social engineering team or not. They were allowed to choose whether they wanted to engage in it or not. All right. So. One of the core things we were interested in is what are the skills and abilities that you need to be able to engage in social engineering? Now we're talking about a population that had a whole mix of experience. So the newest person on the team had spent less than six months doing social engineering. The most experienced person of the, on the team had been doing it for over 15 years. So this is a broad range of experience that we are talking about, okay? And there were lots of things that came up in terms of the skills, the abilities, the knowledge that you need to be good at social engineering, right? So one of the key things was the ability to make friends, right? Being able to get people to like you. And that comes from a combination of things, right? So being personable, right? So being looking well put together, uh, being polite to people, being able to approach people and strike up a conversation, being able to make jokes, right? The um, people said it was, it was really helpful if you were able to be funny. It helps people to lower their guard and want to interact with you. Right. Um, being able to read people is part of that ability to make friends, to get people to like you. So uh, you have to respond to the person in question. So, for example, if you're approaching somebody, um, you want to look for markers like. Do they have a particular hobby or are they expressing certain. Like belonging to certain subcultures. Right. Um, so are you approaching 
a jock? Are you approaching somebody who has tons of pictures of their family on their desk? Are you approaching somebody who's uh, dressed in very colorful clothing, right? So a very self-expressive person, right? The way that you approach each of these individuals is very different. So you have to be able to read somebody really quickly and not just sort of their personality, but also their current state. So is somebody in a bad mood? Is somebody really busy? Um, is somebody in a really good mood, right? You approach those people differently in order to get them to like you, right? So if somebody is tends to be grumpy and you approach them with the bubbly sunniness, that's going to put a grumpy person off, right? Cynics like cynics. <laughs> um, you also really need to be able to communicate clearly. That came out as one of the most important factors when it comes to being able to make friends, right? A second thing that came up was confidence, self-confidence, right? So you need to be able to walk into a situation and do what you need to do, right? You need to look like you belong there and not look timid, right? The, the moment that you start to look like you're hesitant, right? you're going to get caught. So um, actually one of uh, the participants told a story. This individual said he actually learned by observation. He didn't get any formal training in social engineering. So this was his very first, very first time out. He had never done this before. And he went out with somebody with a lot more experience and the instructions were simple. The guy told him, what we're going to do is walk into this building. So all you need to do is stand tall, walk with purpose. You're going to look like you are busy and you have places to get to. Walk right past the security guard and up the stairs. At the top of the stairs, there is a hallway. You're going to turn right into that hallway and that's all you need to do, right? You'll get your next set of instructions in that hallway. Just walk with purpose, walk with confidence and you will be fine. So both of them start walking. And then he starts thinking, oh my God, what am I doing? They're gonna catch me. Uh, so as he's walking past the security guard, right? He's looking to see if the guy's paying attention to him. He makes eye contact and he gets stopped, right? Um, his colleague who was trading him just walks right past, you know, looks like he's busy, walks with purpose. And of course just leaves him there because if, if your colleague gets caught, um, one of you still has to, to complete the testing. So I guess you leave them behind. <laughs> so that was his first experience with social engineering, right? That confidence is so important. That confidence is the difference between somebody stopping you and somebody not stopping you, right? Um, being able to exploit opportunities, being able to um, see that somebody is distracted and walk past them or um, see that somebody has left their uh, access card on their desk and just walk past and pick it up, right? So if you see small opportunities, right? A door has been left ajar, somebody has just walked out of a room, you can just, you know, sneak in there, right? If you see an opportunity come up, you cannot hesitate to exploit that. You have to be able to just think on your feet, respond quickly, act with confidence and jump in there, right? But that also means a high level of risk tolerance. Um, you need to be able, you can't be scared of all the time. You can't be scared of getting caught. You can't be scared of doing something wrong, right? Um, one of the, the people I talked to likened it to, um, he's, a, he's a big adventure guy, you know, he climbs mountains and, zip lines and skydives and so on. So he says that for him, it is a big adrenaline rush, right? He likes risk and he likes to be able to do stuff that where he feels like he's on the edge, right? Which is really interesting because another individual on the same team I talked to says he's very much not like that. He's a big planner. Right? And planning is another um, skill 
that came up in several of these interviews, being able to think ahead, um, having done copious amounts of research, which is not always possible because usually when penetration testers in the field get these assignments, they only have two or three days to prep for these things. So being able to gather information very quickly, come up with plans, right? And contingency plans for your plans, come up with scripts that you can use, right? Being disciplined in your approach. What are the vulnerabilities that I want to test? How do those connect to um, the targets that I am looking at? How do those connect to the various attack vectors that I am planning on, right? So being able to do that is really, some people go for that high risk tolerance, right? That's connected to that adrenaline rush. And some people are able to deal with that high risk tolerance by planning ahead, right? They mitigate the risk by planning ahead, okay? Um, another skill is, actually this came up in almost every interview. Um, I think only two people in this set actually had any acting experience at all. And, you know, one of the most common attack vectors in social engineering, especially if you're doing uh, personal attacks, right? If you're using um, in-person attack vectors is impersonation, right? Being able to pretend that you are somebody that you are not. And across the board, people said, you're not actually acting like a completely different individual. What you're trying to do is be a different, be a version of yourself, right? All of us have very many facets. Even those of us who are extreme introverts can be extroverted, right? In the right situations and given the right recovery time and warning. Um, we all know in certain situations how to be friendly, in other situations, how to be not so friendly right? Um, how to put people off. Um, you know how to project authority, right? So basically, you're playing into who you are. So for example, um, I think a, a great example that one of the, the people I interviewed gave is this was a younger um, gentleman, uh, about two years out of college with, you know, the baby face, right? And he says, so what he plays into very often is being an intern, right? So um, he tries to pick impersonations that have him being new to a company. And that mean that he gets to, that means he can play into ignorance. He can wander into places and say, oh, I'm new here. I was just trying to find my way around or um, he can ask for help you know, and people will give him more help and more access because he is new, <laughs> right? He, so he plays into the baby face. Another example is um, one of the women on the team, right? She says, there are stereotypes about women, there are expectations about women. She happens to be, she's like, you know, I happen to be a very pretty girl. And that works for me because I'm a pretty girl. I play into that. Right. Um, there is another member on the team who is a, it's a very large gentleman, 6'5", you know, over 200 pounds, linebacker in college, right? He looks, he really stands out. And so that can be an asset and a detriment, right? So it's an asset in, um, so for example, when they're in military settings, right? Um, it helps him to, or settings where you find a lot of type A personalities, lots of military or previously military folks, lots of um, sports affiliated people, right? So for example, if they're testing um, sports franchises or stadiums, right? He fits in there and he can connect with people and make them comfortable and make them think he is part of that setting, right? But in an office environment, in a corporate environment, he tends to not do very well because he stands out so much. Right. So play in playing into who you are is really helpful as a social engineer. Okay. Um, being persistent. Another thing that came up um, pretty much across the board. If you try different tactics, if you try often enough, if you try hard enough, you will find a way in. 
That's one of the beauties of social engineering. So if you try something and it doesn't work, you try something and you get caught, and this is one of the benefits of having teammates, somebody else can try something else, right? So you need to be persistent in order to get in. You also need to have a good memory, which I, that was one of the things that surprised me when I heard it, like good memory, really. <laughs> um, but once they explained, it made total sense, right? Because you need to remember, um, you're thinking at several levels at once, right? You're thinking about what you have to achieve in a particular place, or you have to achieve through a particular conversation. You have done, um, in most cases, some previous reconnaissance on the targets that you are talking to. So you want to remember what it is that you have learned about them already, and your plan to exploit those things. But you also have to remember not to reveal those things because you don't want to give away that you know things about them already. Um, you have to remember the stuff that they're telling you, right? But also you have to remember who you've already talked to and what persona you were using with them, right? So as you go through a social engineering penetration test, it's very likely that you're going to um, change up your persona, change up your impersonation, depending on what you're trying to achieve, where you are in the building, what facility you're targeting, and so on and so forth, what your target um, is into, right? Um, what their job is, what their hobbies are, and so on, because you want to be able to connect with them. So you need to be able to remember all of that stuff. So um, one of the people, um, one of the gentlemen I was interviewing actually told a story where, so he goes in the building and, um, you know, he gets all the way to the like the C-suite, right? He can see the CEO's office, which is like the big goal <laughs> for this particular, you know, the CEO wants to know, can you actually make it all the way to the top floor to my office? That was the big goal for this particular engagement. So the office is in sight and he, he, he bumps into somebody, right? And on this floor, he's impersonating um, an executive himself, right? Um, this guy is a janitor. So he bumps into him and he's, he tries to brush him off, right? Pretending that he's an executive. And the guy is like, wait, I've seen you. What are you doing up here, right? And he's like, you know, he tried to bluff his way out of it. But what he realizes as he's doing this is he had forgotten that he had pretended to be a security guard to get into the building and had, had to walk past this janitor, right? So this janitor has seen him as a security guard on the first floor. He has made it all the way, I believe it was like a, you know, 20, 30 something floor building. He's made it all the way up there and he's pretending to be an executive and this person remembered him and he was blown. Right. So you have to remember who you've interacted with and what you said to them. And so it, it's a lot of different moving parts that you have to keep track of. Right. And then there are the physical skills that you need, um, being able to pick pockets, do quick lifts. Right. Being able to pick locks um, and get past not just uh, the mechanical locks, but also different kinds of locking mechanisms. Right. So that's like basic information you have to know. Um, those are the things that are going to come up sort of that you're going to have to improvise. So you know, have to know them on the spot. Um, there are other skills that are useful to have if you're a member of a social engineering team. So things like being able to forge documents, right? Um, is really useful being really good at open source intelligence. So gathering information is also very useful. Um, acting. Like I said, because most of the time you're being a version of yourself rather than pretending to be somebody else, it can be useful to have acting skills, but um, you can get along without them. But what you do need to be able to do is improvise, right? So improvisation, slightly different skill set, but it's really important to be able to, you know, react and think on your, on your feet, right? And then having the right look. That was another thing that came up across the board, having that right look, being um, able to fit in. So uh, well, like their little details, right, can give you away. So one of the people I was talking to told a story. Um, he was impersonating a courier, 
right, to get into this company. Uh, couriers, uh, delivery people tend to be able to get in a lot of places. And he had uh, the logo on his shirt, right? But it was printed on, whereas the company that he was impersonating, their logos were embroidered onto the shirt, right? And somebody noticed, right? So he was talking to somebody and he's like, okay. So I was talking to this person and they kept looking at me like something was off. Like they're trying to, you know, so I was, I'm thinking to myself, have they seen me before? Are they trying to remember me? Um, what's going on, right? So because the person kept looking at him like, you know, and then the person's like, huh, you could see like the moment when it clicked, what was bothering them. And they're like, hey, don't you guys have embroidery on your shirt? And it just threw him and he didn't know what to say. <laughs> and he was blown, right? So sometimes little details like that, having the right look can get you through all kinds of doors, but sometimes just the wrong details somewhere can get you blown, right? Obviously like all penetration testing, a lot of the stuff that you do is confidential. So being able to keep secrets is really important. And um, because physical security is tied into social engineering penetration testing, geometry is actually also really important. You need to be able to figure out um, the right camera angles or things placed in the right place, right? So that's a lot of, it basically comes down to geometry, which again, I was, I was surprised to learn. So looking at all of this, what I found really interesting is that there is this duality, right? You have to be able to blend in, but you also have to be able to stand out. You need to be very disciplined, but you need to be really flexible, right? You need to have, um, you need to be able to plan really well, but you also need to be able to improvise, right? And so looking through, um, these sets of interviews and having listened to all these people, one of the things that emerged is this idea of duality. And they're basically two types of social engineers, right? There are those who are more improvisational, right? More fly by the seat of their pants. Um, they tend to be outgoing confident, right? Good at improvising, um, really good at uh, sort of just getting in there, really flexible, right? Um, high risk taking individuals. And then you have another set of social engineers, right? Who are planners, right? Um, they are better, they tend to be really good at reading people. They're really good at getting people to like them. Right. They have really good um, like physical skills. They're good at exploiting opportunities, right? So there's sort of these dual types. And these dual types are also the, res well, I'm not gonna say the result of dual training, but they tend to emerge from dual training. You have your sort of natural learner in social engineering where social engineering is basically part of their lifestyle, right? Um, so one of the, the young women on the team was actually telling me that for her, social engineering was just such a natural fit because it's what she's always done, right? She always just walks into places, talks her way into things, talks her way out of things. She's actually telling me the story of um, she actually used to um, smuggle drugs, which I thought was so fascinating. <laughs> so she said uh, she used to smuggle drugs on planes before she became, you know, a professional social engineer. In her misspent youth, uh, she would fly, you know, uh, to another state, um, pick up the drugs, and just walk them past the TSA. Right. So it's like, how do you do that? And she's like, it's most, you know, it's a little bit of planning, a little bit of confidence, a little bit of distraction, right? Um, playing into a, a stereotype, you know, are you the pretty girl? Are you the, um, 
friendly girl, right? Are you flirty? You know, you pick a stereotype and you play into it and use it as a distraction so people aren't paying attention to you, right? Um, a little bit of planning, like you need to know sort of what are the security measures? For example, if they have dogs, what are you going to use to set off the, the um, to distract the, the dog's um, scent, right? And confidence. You don't look like you're doing anything wrong. Walk with confidence and people will let you through, right? So for her, the I, you know, when she stopped <laughs> that stuff and you know became a more law-abiding member of society social engineering was a you know she went into that morphed into going into security and then social engineering was perfect for her because she already had all of those skills a lot of people develop these skills because they have um it's called complicated home lives right so uh if you have parents or family members or you grew up in an environment where you need to be able to talk your way out of things either because your home is unstable or because uh, your home is very strict, right? So the only way that you are able to get any freedom or whatever is to be able to, you know, lie and fib and dissemble and so on. Those people also tend to be really good at social engineering, right? And then you have the people who, for whatever reason, are just able to pick it up, right? They can be flexible. They can remember people. They can read people, right? It's just some people, like all personality traits, some people just have more natural talent at this than others. Um, yes, I'm going to pause here and say any questions. All right, so um, from the survey, we actually um, asked some of these questions and tried to quantify some of these things. Uh, you can see the most important characteristics across the board were empathy, high risk tolerance, and confidence, right? And whether that risk tolerance, like I said, comes from a desire to whether that risk tolerance comes from a desire from, for adrenaline, from being an adrenaline junkie, or it comes from being confident in your ability to plan and think ahead and have contingencies, right? So if anything happens, you know what to do. It comes from confidence and it comes from, and then you also require empathy. Those were sort of the three most important characteristics that came up. In terms of skill, um, all right. Uh, it's very easy to assume that something like enjoying being the center of attention or being a huge extrovert would be essential to be a social engineer. But our testing actually showed that that was not the case. Um, the group was pretty evenly split into extroverts and introverts, right? And it goes back to that being who you are. It's okay to be an introvert. You play into who you are. You can still connect to people, right? Um, extroverts tend to get a little bit more attention. And then if you play into that, you connect to people in different ways. So it's being able to use who you are um, to achieve your goals. In terms of skills, um, there's some I want to point out here. The ability to manipulate others scored highly where the ability to control others scored low, right? And this is really interesting because we actually measured these people on what we call the dark triad. Now the dark triad has been used for many, many, many years. There's so many studies that showed this is a reliable um, indicator of criminality, right? A reliable predictor, or it correlates significantly with criminality. And when you have something like penetration testing where you're essentially taking the role of a malicious actor, you would assume that it, it would attract people, right? Who have, tendencies to criminality, but for whatever reason are staying on the right side of the law, right? It turns out that that is not actually the case, right? So if you look at Machiavellianism, Machiavellianism is that desire or ability to strategically exploit and deceive others, right? That sounds like exactly what social engineering is. Um, but if you look over here, I don't know if you can actually see my cursor, right? The norm, so the 
across the population, right? Um, the average score on Machiavellianism is about 3.1, right? In this population, those who scored, who uh, did not like to engage in social engineering actually scored higher in Machiavellianism. And those who did do, who did really enjoy um, social engineering, they were right with the average, right? If you look at narcissism, which is that arrogance, you know, thinking that you're the most entitled, you're the most important person, that idea of being self-important and entitled, right? Um, the norm in the population is 2.8, right? Those who scored, uh, those who did not like doing social engineering so much were right at the norm. So, you know, this was a very average population in terms of narcissism. Those who were high social engineering performers, right? Good at social engineering, like to do it a lot, actually scored lower in narcissism. And this was actually found to be significant, right? So you need to be less narcissistic than the average person to be good at social engineering. And the reason for that is you, you require empathy, which is which you can think of as being the opposite of narcissism. I'm gonna talk some more about that in a second. And then psychopathy, right? So being able to be callous and cynical and not care so much about how you're affecting other people's lives, which you would think is that's one of the key traits of being um, social engineers are essentially scam artists, right? They're con artists. They talk you into doing things that hurt you and help them, right? And they don't care that they're hurting you. But what you find is the norm in the population is 2.4. And both the low and high in this population, now population of social engineering penetration testers, actually score significantly lower on psychopathy. So they do tend to be caring people, right? They are not callous and cynical, right? So what you would expect of the scammer or the con artist is really different from what you see in the penetration tester, right? Okay. Now, a uh, slightly more useful um, set of personality traits is this idea of spheres of control, right? Now, spheres of control can be thought of as how do you interact with the people around you? How do you persuade them and influence them to do what you want them to do, right? Um, so there is personal control, which is control over yourself and the non-social environment, which we're not so concerned about. Well, we are a little bit concerned about that because it plays into those ideas of being disciplined and organized and being able to self-regulate and so on. But we're more interested in this idea of influence, right? So interpersonal control, control over other people, right? And what you see here is that our population of social engineering penetration testers, right? Good, successful social engineering penetration testers who enjoy doing it, tend to score significantly higher in interpersonal control than the average person. And what this indicates is that these individuals do enjoy or have the ability to manipulate others, but rather than that Machiavellianism, which is about exploitation and deceit, right? They tend to use more mechanisms of influence. So nudging people to do what you want, right? And it tends to be more ethically bound and more um, caringly designed, okay? So it is not malicious in action. All right, when it comes to skills, right? Another thing I want to point out that technical skills are really not that important when it comes to social engineering, which makes sense because the majority of what you are doing is getting people to compromise their security for you, right? So it, it's, I mean, having technical skills is great and once in a while you're going to need them, but you don't really need to have a degree in information technology or computer science to be a good social engineering penetration tester. In fact, there are a lot of people in the field who have come out of um, law, right? Um, 
one of the most successful penetration testers I know is um, her background is in quantum physics for whatever reason. Um, so uh, there are people who have come out of, I know a couple of people who came out of social work, right? So there are a lot of paths into cybersecurity and there are a lot of paths into social engineering specifically, which makes sense because it's about dealing with people and those people skills are the most important elements of social engineering. Another thing I'd like to point out is good communication skills, which is another um, aspect of what I was talking about earlier, right? That um, the opposite of narcissism, right? Empathy. And empathy is basically this deliberate effort to step outside of the self and into the experience of somebody else, right? So being able to figure out what somebody else is thinking and feeling, right? And being able to at least partially share in that experience is one of the most important skills that a social engineer can have, right? That's that opposite of narcissism, thinking you're the most important person. You need to be able to focus on the other, right? And in order to be able to do that, you need this idea of being able to recognize that other person, recognize the emotions that they're having, right? Um, develop that shared representation of those emotions. You need to have the mental flexibility. Um, you can think of it as imagination, right? You need to be able to imagine another person's experience, step into their shoes, and that allows you to connect with them. Right? That is why empathy is so, so important. And you can see um, we tested our uh, social engineers on empathy, and those who are uh, our high social engineers, our good social engineers, scored significantly higher in empathy than the average in the general population, right? So that's one of those really important skills when it comes to social engineering. Okay. So another aspect of what we asked um, our participants during the study is about their um, ethical boundaries, right? So essentially what they engage in um, on a daily basis as they're doing the penetration tests is manipulation and deception, right? And a lot of them expressed that it was, it could be difficult for them because the people who tend to be most susceptible to social engineering, are the people who are kind, the people who are nice, the people who are trying to be helpful, right? Because those are some of the easiest things to exploit. So um, does anybody, Remember the case of the Saldana? No, it's, it's really kind of hard when you can't see your audience. <laughs> All right, so this, um, she was a nurse in a, a hospital in England when the Duchess of Cambridge was having her last child, I believe. And a couple of DJs from Australia actually called the hospital um, and pretended to be uh, the queen and asked for her medical information. And this uh, nurse actually turned that information over, right? And they did it live on the air. And she was, you know, when she found out, she was very embarrassed and she actually ended up committing suicide, right? That would be an extreme version an extreme example of how social engineering can result in some very negative impacts on individuals. And those negative impacts are not uncommon, right? Usually after a social engineering engagement, there is some sort of debriefing, right? Where the employees are told, okay, so somebody came in and tested you on this, that, and the other, and these are the things we found. So we're going to you know, change policies in this way or whatever it is. And so when you find out that you have been lied to, you have been deceived, you have been manipulated, it can make you feel awful, right? It makes you feel stupid. It makes you feel small. It makes you feel like you can't trust people anymore, right? And that is something that social engineers know and something that they have to deal with. And so ethics 
you know, ethical boundaries are really important when it comes to social engineering. So we asked these social engineers about their, how they approach their ethics, right? Um, so in the professional setting, what was interesting was most of them thought about social engineering in their professional lives and their personal lives very separately, right? So in their professional lives, they tended to stick to their contract, which I guess makes a lot of sense. Um, I don't know if you've, you've, uh, most of you are familiar with the Coal Fire case. Um, Coal Fire was a cybersecurity company. And one of the things they did was social engineering penetration testing. They were hired by uh, the state of Iowa to do penetration testing um, at various uh, municipal buildings across the state. Um, one of them was uh, a courthouse, a county courthouse, right? So they go into the courthouse, uh, they, they were able to get in successfully. Um, and as they were going through, they, they set off an alarm. Right. So they come out of the building and, you know, the sheriffs have and the deputies have pulled up and, you know, they get arrested, they give themselves up and they say, you know, we're, well, they didn't get arrested, they got detained. And they said, uh, they explained what they were doing there. Right. And usually what happens is you explain what you're doing there, you show them your, what we call the get out of jail free card, right? This letter that says, this letter that's from whoever hired you to do this, it says they have permission to do this. This is what they're doing, you know, penetration testing, please leave them be. So they showed their letter, but the sheriff refused to accept it and arrested them anyway. So they actually got arrested and spent several nights in jail because, um, there was some confusion as to what they were allowed to do um, according to their contract, right? There were contradictions within the contract, number one. And number two, um, the courthouse they were testing, uh, the sheriff claimed it was a county courthouse. So it was under the county jurisdiction and the state did not have permission, did not have the um, ability to give them permission to be in there. Right. So they ended up spending some time in jail. Right. And it became like a whole thing. So all these social engineers, they say we are really careful to stay within the bounds of our contract. Right. We try not to be too sensitive to others. And we try to remember that the reason that we're doing this is to improve everybody's security. Improving everybody's security makes everybody safer. It saves money for the company. It keeps people from being the victims of cyber breaches and identity theft and all of those things that go with that. So basically most of them approach it from um, one of two or a combination of two sort of ethical viewpoints. The first being the dirty hands. If you're not familiar, Walzer's uh, dirty hands theory of ethics basically says that boils down to you can do something that seems ethically dubious and assume the moral guilt that goes with that if the results are beneficial. So basically it's uh, sometimes the means justify the ends argument. And then there's also the utilitarian argument, which I think uh, most people are familiar with, that basically says we want to maximize benefits, right? The most benefits for the most. So we are going to do what we need to do, and it's ethical as long as it maximizes security for as many people as possible. Okay. Um, when it comes to their personal lives, it becomes a little bit more interesting. So the majority, not the entire population, but the majority of the people I talked to, the um, individuals I interviewed, did actually use a lot of these social engineering techniques in their personal lives, right? So I got stories like uh, one individual said, uh, uh, one thing he likes to do is crash parties and weddings. Right. He uses his social engineering skills to show up at places. Uh, he doesn't know anybody. He goes, he's not invited. He makes friends. He hangs out. He gives them a fake name. Um, 
comes the life of the party, uh, parties it up and then leaves, right? Um, another one said they have never had to wait. They've never made a restaurant reservation and have never had to wait because they basically show up and talk their way in, right? They pretend they have a reservation, take somebody else's reservation, whatever it is. Um, another individual said he uses, uh, so actually a couple of individuals said they use social engineering techniques on dates, right? So when they go out on, especially when they're just getting to know somebody, they use social engineering a little bit. Um, one individual said that he uses it a lot when it comes to negotiations. So um, he got almost 50% off when he replaced his roof. And I think he said something like 25% off when the last time he bought a car because of using his social engineering skills, right? So pretty much all of these people use their social engineering skills in some way or another in their personal lives. Um, one of the young ladies said that she likes to, um, this was, uh, as you could probably guess, the individual who used to uh, smuggle drugs. Uh, she likes to try things to see if she can do them, right? So little things. Can I talk somebody into giving me a free ice cream cone? Um, if I see like an employees only or restricted access, like I'm out shopping or whatever, or at a doctor's office and I see somewhere I'm not supposed to be, I like to see if I can get in there and get out without being discovered, right? Talk my way in and talk my way out without being challenged, right? So um, she just likes to sort of see if she can do it, right? So to some extent, all of them used their social engineering skills in their personal lives, but there were still ethical boundaries. And for all of them, the ethical boundaries was it cannot be malicious, right? And it cannot be too risky. So they weigh the risk and the benefits, right? Um, one individual said that every time he sees like an advert for a concert, he's seen all kinds of of groups, plays, um, musicians, you know, every time he sees a show, he tries to determine sort of what's the level of security, even if it's a group he's never heard of, or he's not particularly interested in, he goes to see the show and he, he, he almost never pays. And he very often um, goes backstage, right? Using his social engineering skills. So they do weigh sort of the risk and benefit, but he says, obviously I wouldn't do that if it's something for charity or if it's a, a very like small venue, right? Because I do not want to cause harm to anybody. And this is where the ethical boundary seems to be for all of them. They do not want to cause harm, right? Um, Mike, is our stop at 2.30? Yeah, we usually go till 2.30, but you know, take your time. This is a, <laughs> this is a great talk, um, very fascinating. So, uh, you know, whatever pace you're at, that's fine. Okay, so I'm, I'm almost done, I'm almost done. Right. Um, so yeah, so they, they weigh the harm in every case, right? And I also asked them about how this affected them as individuals, right? Uh, and most of them said that, yes, it had made them more deceptive, right? So that was one of the questions. Do you feel like you lie more, right? You deceive people more, you manipulate people more. And the majority of them said, I tend to be, I, I find myself being more deceptive, yes, but not necessarily more manipulative. All of them said that being um, a social engineering penetration tester and learning and honing these skills had definitely made them more confident, right? And better able to navigate relationships, which I thought was really interesting. So, um, Several of them expressed having difficult relationships with family members and friends. And because of the skills they had learned as social engineers, these being able to empathize with others, being able to read others, uh, being able to expose the particular facet of yourself that you feel is more appropriate, is most appropriate to a particular situation. This has actually helped them in their personal lives sort of lubricate these relationships, right? Made, them ease, made it easier for them to interact with people. All of them said they were now more willing and engaged much more in public speaking, in you know, presentations, in uh, teaching people, right? They weren't afraid to, they were much, even those who were 
who scored highly introverted. We are, we're no longer afraid to be the center of attention for whatever reason, right? So it made them a lot more confident. They also said it made it a lot easier for them to spot deception, right? Um, several of them expressed that they spent a lot more time now watching people and listening to not just to what people actually said, right? So um, one of them put it, I, I thought really well. We spend a lot of time as people assuming what people are saying rather than actually listening to what they're saying and people's word choice, uh, people's nonverbal communication, all of that conveys a lot of information that very often we miss either because we're making assumptions or we're not paying attention. And because I'm a social engineer, because of my social engineering skills, I do that a lot less. So it's a lot easier for me to spot when somebody's trying to deceive me or when somebody's trying to manipulate me. And I also ask them, has this made them cynical, right? Has knowing, has being exposed, for ex first of all, to all of these cyber criminals, right? Because they deal with cyber criminals a lot and having to step into the role of being cyber criminals made them more cynical. And they all said, no, they're, they're all fairly optimistic. They all believe, still believe in people. They still all believe that people are generally good. And so I thought that was really interesting. So um, what are some of the general observations here? Um, the most interesting one I found was social engineering as even more than you would expect is really, really easy, right? Um, one, of them, uh, one of them said, and several others agreed, the number of times you show up somewhere and say, I have a meeting on this floor and somebody just lets you up, you just ask and they will let you in, is staggering. It's like eight out of 10 times. You can just say, I'm supposed to be, I'm supposed to meet so-and-so, I'm supposed to be in this room and they will just let you in, right? If you want to increase your success with that, you can have somebody on the phone and say, oh, I have so-and-so on the phone. I'm supposed to meet with them. Oh, they're telling me it's room such and such. Would you like to um, check with them? 10 out of 10 times, they will let you in. So social engineering can be very easy. Um, the second observation is that uh, social engineering, it's a lot of fun. They all expressed, they all came out of uh, various different careers. Um, some of them were fresh out of, this was the first thing they're done because they were, um, they just graduated, right? But for those who had had previous careers um, in other aspects of cybersecurity, all said that this was the fa their favorite part of their job. This was the most fun thing they'd ever done. They really, really enjoyed it. And another thing they all agreed on is that there is a way to get to everyone, right? You can use social engineering to get into anywhere you want, given enough time and sufficient access, you can figure out a way in, right? So um, they all recommend it as an excellent uh, path if any of your cybersecurity professionals looking for something slightly different. Social engineering is a really great, really interesting way to go. All right, so any questions or comments? I'm most interested in hearing comments. I know I've run out of run over time a little bit. Oh, that's great talk. Um, I've got a couple questions here while we let people type in theirs. Um, actually, I mean, what I'm following along and all I can think about when you're, you know, listing all the skills and the assets is the TV show, Mr. Robot. And I don't know if you've <laughs> watched it or not. <laughs> Um, I mean, what have you wise. thought of that? Okay. I mean, because the main character, Elliot, I mean, he's every, they, they must have, you know, I think they did a great job with it. You know, obviously there's stuff that they have to stretch or whatever, but I mean, it's, you know, when I, I just think of the main character and like, he's hitting like every single day, even to the empathy um, part about it, feeling bad for what he's doing, you know, in, yeah. in situations. I um, right. just found that was pretty amazing. Um, what I found really interesting is there is sort of the, the media stereotype of the hacker, right? I think that we're all familiar with, mm -hmm. but the social engineer tends to be less that and more the stereotype of the con artist, the grifter, mm -hmm. right? The scammer. 
um, or the spy. So the con artist or the spy is the social engineer. And um, Elliot tends to fall into both camps. He's one of yes. those like flexible. Yeah. So he is, he is a good avatar of a social engineer, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, just uh, for attendees, you know, if you want to turn your mic on, you can just raise your hand and I will turn it on, or you can just post a question in the Q and A. Um, another thing I was wondering about is, um, and I thought about it, like when you're talking about confidence and it's like, does that get skewed by, you know, when, when you're doing a uh, actual social engineering test that the person knows, you know, okay, I'm supposed to be doing this. I'm not really going to go to jail, but then, you know, you brought in the story about <laughs> the guys that did go to jail, um, <laughs> which I mean, was, how does that affect it at all? You know? All right. So I will say the coal fire case really sort of shook the entire penetration testing community, especially mm -hmm. the social engineering penetration testers, because it was unusual. Usually penetration testers, you know, you're not going to jail, right? You are allowed to be there. Um, so one of the things I did ask them was, how do you think that you are different from malicious attackers? And so what they said, um, we tend to do less reconnaissance. We tend to have less time and less money to spend on our engagement. So we're flying a little bit more by the seat of our pants. And it is lower stakes because regardless of whether I get in or not, I get paid, right? Where the attacker has to succeed in, other, in order to get paid. So they're willing to take more risks. They're willing to go further. They're willing to be more malicious because, you know, if they don't, they don't succeed, right? And if they get caught, they go to jail. So they're, they may be a little bit more careful. <laughs> So that's, that was sort of their impression of like the difference. Yeah, between right. the two. Right, Okay, it looks like we have a question in the Q&A. All right, so Melissa's asking, were there any negatives to the testing men mindset? I would think that it would make people more paranoid. I'm not sure if I missed any mention of a negative earlier. Okay, so um, it did make them more likely to spot deception, right? It did make them watch people more. Um, but it didn't, I wouldn't actually call it paranoid because they all said they still believe in people, right? So they weren't more scared. They were just more observant. Um, negatives to the testing mindset. Um, a lot of them complained about traveling a lot, right? Because, you know, they're doing testing, but that, that's true of any penetration tester. You're going from one company to another. Um, the other thing was what I mentioned about feeling that guilt because um, you are manipulating people, you're deceiving people, uh, you strike up a friendship with somebody or a fun conversation with somebody, or you sit and talk to somebody about their kids in order to connect with them and then use that to compromise them. And then they find out later that that's what you were doing, which makes you feel like a horrible person, obviously. So they said, there is a lot of that guilt that comes along with it, especially because in a few cases, um, the people that they compromise get fired, right? So if the breach of security is fairly egregious, if you really weren't, if they got you to compromise policy in a large way, you could actually lose your job, which I think would feel awful for any reasonable person. Okay, it looks like I have a hand raised here. Um. The other TV shows this reminds me of are The Mentalist mm -hmm. and Lie to Me. Yes. <laughs> a decade or so ago, right? Yes, yes. Um, the Mentalist is, is a little bit overblown. Like that's not you know, it's highly exaggerated, I would say. Lie to Me um, was actually based on Paul Ekman, who was one of the premier uh, researchers in the field of nonverbal communication. Right. So ever looking for research on that. So the first season, I think, of Lie to Me is really good. I actually recommend my students watch it. But uh, yeah, it, it, as time went on, you know. You oh, know, it's it, it got a little bit weird. <laughs> right. yeah. It got a little bit weird. Um, another good show is Leverage. Uh, so that's an American show about like grifters and thieves. Uh, there's a British show called Hustlers, 
was it called Hustlers? Yeah, I think it's called Hustlers. Um, there's actually, there was actually a show that was, it was a reality show about a team of social engineers. That's really, really hard to find. I've, I've actually never been able to find it um, because it, it's not online anymore. Oh, what was it called? Ooh, I can't think of the name right now, but there was like one season of it. It's like 12 episodes of, you know, it was a reality show with social engineers. It's really cool. Great talk. Thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Yeah, that was great. Thanks a lot, Ida. <laughs> All right. Um, I guess yeah, so we have your email up there and yeah. I believe I was going to put in your website address here, but um, I don't have well, um, Yeah. No, it's okay. You're, you're better off just emailing me. It's probably the easiest way to reach me. Okay. For oh. those of you who are Purdue students, you can also reach me through, you know, like Teams or whatever. All right. Take care. Bye.